Several years ago, there was a, a plane that was flying from Seattle to San Francisco, and, you know, something kind of went wrong. They had to stop in Sacramento, and so the pilot comes out, and he says, um, you know, we're going to be here for just a little while. If you would, please, um, you know, if you'd like to stretch your legs, you can exit the plane and kind of walk around the gate for a little bit, but come back in about an hour. And so everybody gets off the plane except for one man. He was, uh, he was blind. And so the pilot goes to him and says, sir, would you like to, you know, like for me to help you off the plane? He said, no, I'm, I'm fine here, but if you would, could you please kind of take my dog for, uh, you know, let him stretch his legs a little bit? He said, sure. So the pilot steps off the plane and people immediately froze. <laughs> and some of them even started booking other flights because here's their pilot wearing sunglasses being led by a guide, guide dog. <laughs> now, what we learn from that is this, and that is sometimes things are not the way they appear. And the same thing's true with the Bible, that there are things in the Bible that we wonder about, we question things that are difficult, things that seem harsh and hard, and yet that's where we have to dig deeper than just how things appear on the surface. We are in the midst of a series called Too Tough to Swallow, and what we're doing really is exploring the hard issues of Scripture. Um, I want to encourage you, there is, uh, you know, as we go through this, well, one of the reasons we're going through this is because, you know, attacks against the Bible, particularly by atheists, are becoming more and more outspoken. And, you know, there's even a website, they're actually even saying that the Bible itself is evil. Um, there it is there. Okay, the Bible itself is evil. There's even a website, and I showed this last week, evilbible.com. And here's just one quote, for too long priests and preachers have completely ignored the vicious criminal acts that the Bible prom promotes. The so-called God of the Bible makes Osama bin Laden look like a Boy Scout. And this morning, we're going to really dive into that deeper. And I want to encourage you that, you know, as we go through today, there's only so much I can cover in about 30 minutes. All right, 35, 40, 45, 50 minutes, okay. But... <laughs> uh, we, we do have an opportunity on Wednesday night to dive deeper. I think Steve mentioned this. There's a, a group uh, we meet back for discussion back in the uh, family room at 7 o'clock on Wednesdays. Also, I want to encourage you. I hope there's enough copies back there. If not, you can see one of us, myself, Steve, or Cindy, and there should be a, a, a list of additional resources available. And so, so I want to encourage you with that. But today what we're going to do is really look at one of the most difficult issues in Scripture, and that is the cruelty of God. Studies show that this is the number one reason that people lose their faith in God. And it's usually phrased as a question that starts with, how could a loving God, dot, dot, dot. And there's, we're going to examine really two aspects of this question. There's really more than this, but we're only going to be able to do two. Number one would be kind of situational. How could a loving God allow so much suffering in our world today? How could a loving God have taken the life of my child? How could a loving God have allowed the Holocaust to happen? How could a loving God allow people to starve to death? Great question, isn't it? And we're going to look at that at the end, but the first of all, we want to look at this one, and that is, from a scriptural aspect, statements that are found in the Bible, how could a loving God command his people to wipe out entire civilizations? Now, let me give you an example of that, because these are, there's a number of these in scripture. First Samuel chapter 15, verse 3 says this, God told Saul, now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. You go in and you just obliterate them. You annihilate them. Men, women, children, babies, even the livestock. Wow. How do you harmonize that command with the concept of a loving God. If you struggle with that, I think we all do. So here's the answer. In one word, Jesus. Now, there's going to be a lot more I'm going to say, but I, I want to start with that. We'll start right there because, honestly, I read statements like that and other statements, and I don't get God. I don't think really any real thinking person can say, I really get that, 
But I do get Jesus, at least to some degree. And one of the reasons Jesus came was to show us what God is like. Hebrews 1 and verse 3 says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of its being. God said, I know you don't get me. I know you don't understand what I'm like. So Jesus comes down and says, here's what I like. You wonder, you wonder, you wonder what God's like. Well, this is it. And what God is saying is, I want you to understand me. Look at me through the lens of Jesus. Because Jesus is the exact representation of God's being. Now, there's other statements in Scripture similar. Colossians 2, 9. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Jesus said, John 10, verse 30, I and the Father are one. John 14, 9. Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. You want to know what God's like? Jesus says, look at me, because I'm exactly like the Father. So right off the bat, and we're going to come back to this, we need to start at this point and go, okay, there's a lot of things about God I don't get, but I do see Jesus. I see a God who was willing to stoop down and humble himself and come into this world in the most humble of circumstances, who was willing to endure the worst torture known to the ancient world. A creator for us. A creator who was willing to die for his creation and bear, take upon himself every sin we've ever committed. That's where we need to start. So we go back to those Old Testament scriptures, and they're all in the Old Testament that talk about those kinds of things, that we go, well, what if there's more than just meets the eye? When you see your pilot with a guide dog, what if there's a story behind that, something deeper, something else is going on? Now, those of you that know my wife know that she's one of the most kind, loving, compassionate people in the world. Well, most of the time. She's not here now to defend herself, but she heard this already in first service, so. And I got her permission, so. Now, let's just suppose, I know my wife. We've been married 45 years, and I know her heart. I know her character. So let's just suppose we're downtown tomorrow, and I look, you know, maybe she's half a block ahead of me, and I look up, and she goes up and talks to a handicapped person standing on the street, maybe just has one leg, standing on a crutch, and Linda will do this. She'll go up and say, I just want you to know I think you're beautiful and you're awesome. I've seen her do that a number of times. So anyway, so she, I see her going up talking to that person. I go, okay, here she goes again. And then all of a sudden I notice she shoves the person down to the ground. And then she takes the crutch and starts hitting him with the crutch. Now, if you're watching that, if you're standing there beside me, you're going to go, she's one of the most evil people that ever lived. I mean, who beats up a handicapped person? And I'm going to have some doubts myself at that moment. But... I know my wife. I know her character. And I, and I know there's something else going on. There's more than just what's on the surface. I don't know what it is. Maybe the person's having a heart attack and she's trying to revive them. <laughs> or maybe, you know, somehow, you know, she's working for the government. This guy is actually a posing as a handicapped person. He's a terrorist. And so she, because they've observed her talking to this person, they go, you know, would you kind of take him out for us or something? I don't know. <laughs> or maybe it's a reality show. Maybe I'm being punked, okay? <laughs> my point, those are crazy far-fetched examples, but my point is there's something else going on because that doesn't match up with her character. And when I look at God through the lens of Jesus, I know here's a God that says, love your enemies. Here's a God that says, turn the other cheek. Here's a God that's willing to die for the worst of sinners. So what's going on here? How do you harmonize these two pictures? Well, let's ask the first question then. How could a loving God command genocide? Well, I want to start with this point, and that is, we're going to look at kind of five principles. First of all, this was not God's desire to wipe out civilizations. It's not what he wanted or wants. Second Peter 3, 9, he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. That was God's desire. So what's going on here? Well, remember last week we talked about the fact that God meets us where we are. 
And then he moves us toward his perfect will. You remember we talked about that in terms of slavery and so forth, because last week we talked about the, does the Bible violate human rights? And we, we, what was going on is that God accommodated their practices. We saw this, he, he accommodated their practices when it came to divorce. That wasn't God's desire, or polygamy, or slavery, or even their desire to say, give us a king. Now, I want to suggest God in some ways... There's more to the story, but in some ways, God accommodated their views of violence. 3,400 years ago, the world was a totally different place. And the cultural views of, God, of their gods were, at that time, if you didn't slaughter all your enemies and totally annihilate them, that meant you were a weak god. So that's the reference points that Israel has. They really couldn't think outside that box. They were unwilling to relate to God in any way. If you don't wipe these people out, then you're weak. And so God was willing to lower himself to their level and work with his people. Some of the ancient church fathers said this. Here's Origen, who uh, lived 184 to 253, said, when you come upon portraits of God that are unworthy of God, there you must look through the surface and find a treasure in the depth. In other words, there's more than what's on the surface. Novation, who uh, lived 250 to 258 A.D., said we find mediocre pictures of God because God's revelation had to be fitted to the Israelites' state of belief. The Israelites viewed God not as God was, but as the people were able to understand. Now, he's not saying God's mediocre. He's just saying in our mind, we have mediocre views of God, and we still do. But God sometimes accommodates himself so we can understand. See, the problem is we try to make God into us. We create God in our image, which is the opposite. And um, God's nothing like us. Psalm 50 and verse 21 says, When you did these things, he's talking about their sinful practices, and I kept silent, you thought I was exactly like you. God's not like us. Now, let me illustrate this, and this will help you understand what God's doing here. Back in the, in the 1980s, there was this uh, missionary couple that went to the Horn of Africa to work with this tribe, and they practiced uh, female circumcision, or female genital mutilation, it's called today. And it was, they were horrified by this. And, and they immediately wanted to try to change it, but they knew <clears throat> the people wouldn't listen to them. They just moved in there. They had to earn the right to be heard. And so for three years, they endured these, these circumstances, situations that just ripped their hearts open as they heard these young girls screaming. They, they watched, I mean, they saw, you know, diseases coming, or some of them even died from this. And they said nothing. Now, if you were there or you were reading about this, and you read they didn't say anything, you would assume, well, and the tribe did too, they're okay with this. In fact, they even took it a step further. They actually improved the practice. They introduced surgical instruments, sanitation, painkillers, antibiotics, things of that nature, and then eventually, after three years, they were able to, to lead the tribe to Christ, and they stopped the practice. But it took that, that time. Now, that's in some ways what God's doing here. He's enduring this. Yeah, I know he commanded it, but he was meeting them where they were. It was not what God wanted, but he moved the people forward until finally Jesus came and said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight. And so we got to start with that point and understanding this isn't God's heart. This isn't what God wants. But also, again, there's more to the story. There are some underlying reasons that we need to look at to understand God's commandment to destroy them. And it's a huge part of this is to understand the moral conditions of the Canaanites. Now, the Canaanites took moral depravity to a whole new level. It's interesting that God told his people, you want to make you know, um, alliances, or you want to, what's the word I'm trying to think of here? You want to uh, really, uh, you know, make uh, treaties with the nations around you, that's okay. But don't make treaties with the Canaanites. 
I need to share a couple things with you, and this is going to be hard to hear, but this helps us understand the world and, and, the, and the Canaanite world into which Israel moved. Archaeologists have discovered something called a foundation sacrifice. And, and what it was is that there was a, when there was a couple, a husband and wife, who would, who would build a new home, they would take one of their children and offer it as a sacrifice. They'd burn the baby alive, take the bones, put it in a jar, and place the jar in the foundation because they believed that would bring a blessing on their home. In fact, archaeologists of different sites, idolatrous sites, all around Canaan have found thousands of of skeletons of little babies. This wasn't an isolated practice. When the Bible talks about worshiping idols, you want to know why God's so harsh about it? It's not he's on an ego trip says don't worship another God. This is what they were doing. One of the worst was Molech, the god Molech. He was like this giant bronze bull and as he would be, would be seated like a human would, but his arms would be out like this, and there would be a fire down below. They would place little babies on his arms. They would roll down into the fire and be burned alive. People in the background, the priests would be beating on drums to drown out the screams of the babies. I, I know that's hard to hear, but I want us to understand when God says, go in and wipe out these people, it wasn't just like, I'm just kind of ticked off at these people. About the closest parallel, I've thought about this, that I could find to this in our world today would be Satanism, human sacrifice. I mean, what if we were an entire culture and that's how we worshiped? Now, I think of this, and, and this will maybe help us understand it, it's, I call this the parable of the Tupperware. You ever like, maybe you, you're wanting to make a sandwich and you're looking in your refrigerator for something, you know, sandwich meat or something, and you see way back, last time you cleaned out the refrigerator, you forgot to take this Tupperware out. It's way back in the corner and you pull it out and you're looking at it and go, I don't know how long that's been in there. And you open it up and whoa. And there's this mass, this goo of multicolored, unrecognizable substance. What do you do with it? My daughter will say, you eat it anyway. But no, I don't. Because <laughs> I'll eat anything. Almost. Okay. Now, what do you do with it? You don't probe around and go, well, is there something I can make a sense? No. Guess what you do? You throw it away. And if my wife's not there, I throw away the Tupperware too. Because I don't want to mess with that. <laughs> now, here's, I'm not trying to trivialize this, but God deals with nations the way that we deal with rotten food and Tupperware. I mean, there comes a point where you go, there's nothing else I can do to redeem this. When nations are practicing the kinds of things that they were doing were the most holy, religious, godly, worshipful thing they do is burn their children alive, they're past the point of redemption. You ask, we ask the question, how could a loving God do that? My question is, how could a loving God not do it? How could a loving God stand back and go, well, you know, I just love these people so much. Of course he loves them. But there's a time when it's like there's not anything else you can do. And I hope we understand that with, when it comes to God. Now, here's another factor to consider. And that is, this was necessary for God to protect and preserve Israel, his people. Now, it's not that the Israelites were, were a whole lot more righteous, but it's like, what's, he has a purpose here. And what's going to happen if they make a treaty with these nations? Well, he warns them. He says this in Deuteronomy 7, Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods. If you make treaties with them, just their presence there will pull you away and you'll start doing the same things they're doing. You go, no way. They, the Israelites would never you know, practice child sacrifice. Well, look at 2 Kings 17, verse 8. They followed the practices of the pagan nations the Lord had driven out from the land ahead of them. Verse 17, they even sacrificed their own sons and daughters in the fire. It was their failure to carry out this command that God gave them that eventually led them to do the same thing where they're practicing human sacrifice. 
Now, here's the principle. Sometimes you have no choice but to destroy one thing to save something bigger. Let's just suppose I told you you know, just suppose I, I, you know, you just notice I don't have a pinky. My pinky, it's, I, it's there, but just suppose it's not. And you go, what happened to your finger? And I go, well, believe it or not, there was this guy that took me and drugged me, laid me out on his couch, and chopped my finger off. You'd go, what kind of sicko is that? Oh, I forgot something. He was a doctor, and I had malignant melanoma. <laughs> that changed things? <laughs> Yeah, all of a sudden now you understand, if I go to the doctor and he says, there's a weird growth there, let's check it out, let's do a biopsy, and he says, this is a malignant melanoma, it's very serious. If we don't chop your finger off, it'll spread to your body and you'll die. Guess what I'm going to say? Here it is, doc, chop it off, get the hatchet, or whatever they do anyway. You get the idea that, and, and that's really, in, again, in the, in the moral, spiritual realm, God does the same thing. There's no choice. He preserves his people. But beyond that, there's more. God is so merciful and compassionate that he gave them 400 years to repent. Now, here's what happens. He, he talks about four generations in Genesis 15, but what it means is that God says, you're going to have a son, he's going to have a son, he's going to have a son, he's going to have a son, and they're going to go down to Egypt, and after four generations, they're going to come out, and he says, it will be, this is to Abraham, there will be, you, it will be four generations before your descendants come back here, because, catch this, I will not drive out the Amorites until they become so wicked, they must be punished. It wasn't like God just on a whim went, Bzzz. it's like he says, you know what? Even though I know I'm going to have to do it, I'm going to plead with them, work with them, try to bring them to repentance for 400 years. Now, there's a whole lot more I could say, but just here's something that's kind of overarching in all of this that we cannot get because God has an eternal perspective and we don't. He lives above the timeline. God sees what we can't see. God knows what we don't know. How can we understand it? Our perspective is so limited. It's like if you take a toddler, two-year-old, and the parents, how much does that toddler really understand about what the parents are doing? The toddler ever think the parents are mean and evil and, yeah, sometimes. The toddler doesn't get it. And we're like the toddlers, only more so. God says in Isaiah 55, verse 8, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. See, we think this world's all there is. But this is the matrix. You know what I mean? It's like this world is like that compared to eternity. It's like if you had a rope and you went up to the stars with this rope, one of the furthest star, you know, billions of light years away, and we pull off a little thread. That's God's perspective. And here's this little thread, and I'm saying, here it is. That's all the perspective I have, and I'm critical of God. Really? There's a whole lot more. God has an eternal perspective. Now, I got to tell you this. Even with everything I've been talking about for the last however long I've been talking, I still don't get it. I still struggle with this. I can understand it a little better. But once again, that's why Jesus came. So we could look at God through the lens of Jesus. Now, moving on to the second point, and that, that really connects with the second point right here, and that is, it's very similar in some ways, how could a loving God allow so much suffering in our world? We look around. Well, that's based on a huge assumption, and that assumption is that a loving God would not allow suffering. I want to suggest to you, really, the truth is a loving God must allow suffering. What would you think if I told you that, you know, I just love my wife so much that I'm going to protect her from everything bad happening to her? I'm going to make sure she never has any money because, you know, you can abuse money and, and that'll create pain and I want to protect her from that. I want to make sure she never leaves the house because, you know, it's a dangerous world out there. And so I, you know, lock the doors, board up the windows, make sure she can't get out. 
And if she does, when she does leave the house, you know, I make sure she's with me all the time because I just don't want her to get hurt. I just love her so What are you going to say about me? You are a psychotic weirdo. <laughs> That's putting it mildly. Okay, now. But isn't that what we're asking God to do? The truth is, loving someone requires giving them the freedom to choose. And yes, it leads to bad choices. It leads to mistake. It leads to pain. Look around in our world. That's what we see. And if God intervened every time we made bad choices, which is what we want God to do, here's somebody that's, you know, abusing another person. Stop it, God. If God did that every time, we would have no freedom. We would be robots. Millions of times every day, maybe billions of times, we make choices in this world that break God's heart. Human trafficking, abortion, you know, hunger, things like that. I've had to wrestle with this in my own life with, you know, my family and, you know, things that happened to them and going, God, why did you let this happen? I just want to say the very fact that there is, now catch this, the very fact that there is suffering in our world demonstrates that God is a loving God, that he allows that to happen. Do I still understand it? No. But here's the bottom line. As much as we struggle with understanding God, we need to trust him. Back to the toddler parent analogy there, that the toddler cannot understand what the parent's doing. But the toddler can trust his parents. The toddler can say, okay, yeah, my parents are mean. Yeah, they're, you know, they do all kinds of horrible things to me. They make me, you know, eat carrots and won't let me live on candy, whatever, you know. But the parents have a bigger, can see the bigger picture. There is a whole lot going on in our world that we don't see. We are fighting. We are fighting an enemy who is real. And we want to blame God for all the bad things. I want you to think of it like this. Let's just suppose it's D-Day. And in Normandy, you know, right where the, the, you know, the, 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 the Allied troops landed... You know, on a beach, a little cottage on the beach, there's a family there. It's a, and let's just say there, it's a, a man and his wife and three kids, and they are the, da- the son and the daughter-in-law and the grandchildren of the head captain that's in charge of the fleet invading Normandy. And they're right where the fighting is the thickest. And they're getting shelled and bombed and, you know, they're, they're, some of them are even wounded. And they're, let's just say they can radio to their father and say, please stop the fighting. We're hurt. We're your family. Where are you? How could a loving father let this happen to his children? Well, he would love to step in and stop the fighting, wouldn't he? Unfortunately, there's a bigger picture. There's a war that's raging there. And as much as he'd like to stop his family or step in and stop the fighting, there's something bigger at stake. Now that's kind of the position God's in. There's a war going on. And yeah, we cry out to him. We say, God, where were you? Why do you let this happen to me? Why do you let this happen to my family? In reality, God's saying, there's so much more to it. We need to learn to trust God. Like Job. Job had to learn this because Job was, well, if you know the story of Job, he lost everything. He lost his family. He lost his possessions. He lost his health. And then his friends come and they start attacking him. And finally his faith, he, he, he got worn down, never gave up his faith in God. But he began saying some things like God doesn't really care if you're good or bad. Where is God? He's abandoned me. He doesn't even, he, basic message is, where are you, God? How could a loving God let this happen? You see, he kind of phrases it a little differently. He says, if God was here, I'd debate him, and I'd have a few things to say to him. So guess what? God finally shows up. And in Job 38, he asks a question here. He says, where were you? 
when I laid the earth's foundation. Tell me if you understand. And then God asked a series of questions. You know, how do you do this? How do you do that? Come on, genius. Tell me. You want to question me? I'm God. I created all this. You to Explain. And he asked a series of questions that scientists today don't even know the answer to. And then finally Job gets his chance to speak. Oops. And he says this. In Job 42... I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. And God never tells him why. God doesn't make himself accountable to us. Let me explain all these things. We couldn't understand it anyway. So in the end, here it is. Oops. There is a God, and you're not him. Amen. <laughs> that's, that's, that, that, okay, we can go home. No. In the end, we just must let God be God. There's a video I want you to take a look at, and I want to thank Dustin for uh, sharing this with me, and so we could show it. It's uh, by a group called Ghost Ship, and it's called Where Were You? The statements in this song are almost entirely taken from the book of Job. So let's take a look. I said, God, I do not understand this world. Everything is dying and broken. Why do I see nothing but suffering? God, I'm asking, could this be your plan? Sin has taken hold of this whole land. Will you not say anything else to me? He said, where were you the day that I measured? Sunk the babes and stretched the line over all the earth and carved out its cornerstone. Where were you the day that I spoke and told the sun to split the night open? Called the morning dawn with its light to show. Shut in the ocean with stone doors Marked the reach of tides on those new shores On the day the waves rose and first broke forth Have you seen the springs of that great sea?
Things too wonderful for me Although I had no right to ask My God knelt and answered me That last line is just so powerful, isn't it? I didn't have the right to ask these things, but God knelt. God came down to us and humbled himself and stooped. There's still a lot of this I don't understand. I can't understand it. I don't get God. I mean, he's infinite and I'm not. He's all-powerful and I'm not. He's eternal and I'm not. And just like that parent and the small child, it's not possible to have that same perspective as he has. But is it possible for a child to simply trust his parents, even though they don't make sense to him? Because that's what faith is. I mean, if, if, if it made sense, it wouldn't take faith, would it? But here's what I know. God is good, even when we don't get him. And so I come back to what I said at the beginning, that overarching principle that we view God through the lens of Jesus. And that's why Jesus came to show us what God is like. He bent down to us. And in the midst of the fog of trying to understand God, I can look at Jesus and say, okay, so that's what God's like. You can ask a lot of questions I don't have the answers to. But I'm confident of this. God is good. And I can trust him even when he doesn't make sense. I want to encourage you this morning. We have communion over here that really is a way for us to physically connect with the time when God stooped down to our level and said, I'll take it all for you. That's the picture of God. I also want to encourage you this morning, we'll have a prayer team up here. Maybe you've struggled with these or, you know, on a personal level, there's some issues you're struggling with going, God, where are you? We all ask that. That's not a bad thing to ask those questions. It's not a bad thing to have doubts of our, in our faith. Those are healthy things of a, a faith that's growing. God can handle your questions, okay? So this morning, there's a, 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 there'll be a group of men and women up here you can come and pray with if uh, you're struggling in any way. So, Father, I just thank you today. Um, I thank you for the mystery. Thank you that we don't understand you because what that means is you're so much greater than we are. God, open our eyes, open our hearts to just receive you, to trust you, to just rest in your arms and let you be our daddy, our papa, And God, we just, uh, we love you. Help us. Help us to understand you more by looking at you, Jesus. And it's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen. Thank you.